Hello, and welcome to History is a Crime podcast. Before we get into it, this episode contains dead animals, dead kids, dead wives. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to History is a Crime. I'm your host, Michael, and I'm here with my beautiful wife, as always, Emily. Hello. <laughs> How you feeling today? Feeling good? Why? Are you going to tell me about dead kids? You feeling good? <laughs> You're going to tell me about dead kids, uh, aren't you? So welcome back to our second episode. Welcome to our second episode. Yay. You ever heard of Ruby Ridge? Um, I've heard of it. I don't know anything about it, though. I mean, I didn't either. Uh, turns out we both grew up, like, real close to it, actually. Um, the American school system is, like, a 10 out of 10. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ruby Ridge, turns out they're right in our backyard. And, got 30 years ago now, something not great happened. You ever heard of the Weaver family? We're going to talk about them today, and we'll see if you're still doing good at the end of today. <laughs> you're like, you're pausing so much in between. I'm like, oh, fuck, what's coming? <laughs> <laughs> he looks me in my eyes and says, how's your day today? Because I'm just going to light it on fire. Let's, let's just get into it. Let's just get into it. Okay. Tell me this terrible story. <laughs> so Randall Claude Weaver was born to Clarence and Wilma Weaver on January 3rd, 1948. The Weaver family was deeply religious and had a habit of bouncing around between various denominations in an attempt to find one that suited them best. This would change for Randy later in life after professing his faith in Jesus at age 11. He would later state that he'd become an atheist, but that happens way later. Growing up, Randy had average grades and played baseball and football for his high school. At age 20, Randy joined the Army where he was stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, and he joined the Green Berets during Vietnam. The United States Army Special Forces, colloquially known as the Green Berets due to their distinctive service headgear, are a special operations force of the U.S. Army that are designed to deploy and execute nine doctrinal missions. Unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, direct action, counterinsurgency, special reconnaissance, counterterrorism, information operations, counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and security force assistance. Wow, I definitely didn't think there was that much that went into it. I'm like, cool, you have a green brain. <laughs> I like your hat. I, <laughs> I like your hat. <laughs> could you imagine? Could you imagine like some green beret at Target and someone walking up and just be like, oh my God, I love your hat. Where'd you get Where it? Where did you get Where that? Where did you get that? All in all, Randy's life or Randy's early life seems to be fairly normal, uh, other than being a pretty extreme religious fundamentalist growing up. Uh, I never really found anything about Randy that was anything other than just a dude going about his life. Yeah. Played sports in school, joined the Army, left the Army. I don't think I said this earlier, but um, Randall's family, Randy is mostly what I'm going to call him. Randy's family uh, was from Iowa. So after he left the Army, he went back to Iowa. Randy married Victoria Jordison, who went by Vicky shortly after leaving the Army and moving back to Iowa. Uh, I wanted to include something about her early life because I'm sure she is like a real human being somewhere. Um, and she is an actual part of the story, but I wasn't really able to find much notable about her. Uh, most media outlets and news articles seem to think of her as a little more than an extension of Randy, which seems really, really unfair to me. She, uh, I just, I really couldn't find that much about her specifically. In any case, they were married in Iowa, where Randy worked at the John Deere factory, and Vicky found work as a secretary before becoming a stay-at-home mom once they started popping out kids. One time. At band camp. <laughs> I made a boyfriend. <clears throat> a pair of... You made a boy... Listen, oh, Listen, okay. I made a boyfriend a pair of John Deere sweatpants, and I was so extremely proud of them. Like... I went and bought the fabric and I used like a sewing machine to make these felt John Deere sweatpants. And I was like so stoked. Bitch, he put them on. They were fucking awful. <laughs> they were so like short and they fit weird. Oh my God. But he pretended to be so happy. It was a good memory. So every time I think of John Deere, I think of these atrocious sweatpants that I was proud of until they went on a person. <laughs> uh, did you know that John Deere... Uh, 
that John Deere green, they're the only ones that are, that's like a copyrighted color. Uh, in the 80s, the farm crisis hit r- rural Iowa. Rural. 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 <laughs> uh, due to a variety of factors, including inflation, soaring operating costs, and out-of-control interest rates, farms and businesses began closing at, an, at just an alarming rate. Uh, with Randy working at a factory that produced tractors, his job was in jeopardy. What year was this? Uh, this was in the 80s. Uh, it kind of, I mean, it started during the Depression mm. uh, and then just started cascading. Mm. Got it. And then in the 80s, it really started hitting a lot of a lot of major farms. And that's kind of all Iowa is, mm-hmm. or at least was. I don't know what Iowa is now, just cornfields, I think. With Randy working at a factory that produced tractors, his job was now in jeopardy. It was around now that the Weavers were taking a fancy to biblical prophecy. Vicky, uh, the household's religious leader, interpreted Old Testament passages very literally. In an interview with PBS, Sarah Weaver said that the family TV was removed from the house due to verse Leviticus 26.1. Ye shall not... Nope. Fuck. I, <laughs> I immediately started reading that wrong. <laughs> Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down onto it, for I am the Lord, your God. I was going for Southern Preacher. Uh, oh, shit. All right. You might, you might just try it without the accent. Man, I tried. She, she interpreted old, the Old Testament scripture uh, from Leviticus so literally that the TV was an image that people were paying more attention to than God. Oh. So the, they, she just said, nope, and pitched the TV. And because the only thing, the only image that you should ever pay any attention to is... Uh, an image of God. Now, this passage refers to false idols, but helps illustrate for you that Vicky was the religious leader in the household. Uh, scriptures about the rumors of war, famine, disease, and the like were really starting to line up in their heads. Uh, in the 80s, the Vietnam War wasn't that old. Desert Storm is kind of just around the corner. Mm. This is this is the height of uh, the HIV epidemic. Dude, that is amazing to me that that wasn't that long ago. Like, when I watch episodes of ER and someone comes in, they're like, oh, you have AIDS, sorry, you're fucking death sentence, you have, like, a two-year window to live. And I'm like, that was just in the 90s, dude. That's insane. And now, like, it's not even close to a death sentence. Like, it's just, like, people can have babies with HIV now. Mm-hmm. Like, you, like, and that's, like, they live a totally full life. And I think it's fascinating that less than 30 years ago, like, it was a straight-up death sentence. Yeah, I just read an article not too long ago about uh, they're doing human testing on an HIV vaccine. Whoa! Which is super cool. They've had antiretrovirals against it for a long time, but now they're starting to test a vaccine against it, which I think is really cool. So the Weavers left Iowa telling friends and family that a great conflagration was coming and that they needed to move to a remote mountaintop to wait out the impending apocalypse. So they moved to Ruby Ridge in Idaho, about an (gasps) hour north of Coeur d'Alene. And we didn't learn about this? Nope. I had never once heard of this until I was listening to another podcast and they mentioned Ruby Ridge and I was like, oh, what happened there? And then had to start looking into it. <laughs> so for anyone who is not local, Coeur d'Alene is uh, 30 minutes-ish from here? Yeah. This is about an hour from us. So cool. And we've never heard anything about it. Awesome. 10 yeah, out of 10. Closer to Bonner's Ferry than Coeur d'Alene, I guess, but that's really not that far from there. The cabin Randy and Vicky built was about as remote as you could get. No running water, no electricity, and almost no road access. This is exactly what they wanted to wait out Armageddon. All told, Randy and Vicky had four children. Sarah and Samuel were born before the move, with Rachel and Elisheba coming after. I had to double check that like five times to make sure it wasn't supposed to be Elizabeth. It is not. (laughs) Do you know where that name like comes from? It's biblical, but that's all I know. Oh. Well, the other kids, they were like, fuck you guys. <laughs> you just get normal names, and then we have the coolest name ever for the last kid. Well, Samuel and Rachel are both biblical. Sarah, I don't think comes from the Bible, but I could be totally wrong about that. I've never really studied theology at all. The kids helped with gardening, water hauling, firewood gathering, hunting, and all the other things one would need to do to make it in such conditions. Sarah Weaver said her and Samuel were best friends and played in the woods together whenever they weren't choring. Joran. 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 Name that TV show. The Weavers may not have known that the Aryan Nations were headquartered and founded by 
man named Richard Butler in Hayden Lake. Oh, fuck. Yeah, just 60 miles south of their compound when they moved to Ruby Ridge. I was raised there. Well, even even when I was growing up, so I mostly grew up here in Spokane. And I had always heard that like northern Idaho was a, an Aryan stronghold. I didn't realize that they were founded in Hayden Lake. Like the entire Aryan nation was founded in Hayden Lake? Yeah, Is that what Richard you Bu- said? Yeah, Richard Butler founded the Aryan nation in Hayden Lake. I don't think I processed that when you said it. Oh, well, I mean, wait, is the KKK the Aryan Nation? No. Oh. They do make a cameo in this story, though. Awesome. Yeah. Being as remote as their home was, the Weavers had very little contact with the outside world and so attended functions and family picnics at the racism house. (laughs) What? (laughs) Did you say that? Yeah, no, that was, yeah, that was. That was you. Okay, I was like, it wasn't, you didn't have a big sign over the door that said (laughs) racism racism house. house. It might as well have. I mean, oh my God. I mean, they wore swastikas and SS insignias, like just on their arms, so. Over time, Randy really bought into their shitty message, which in turn is based heavily on Christian identity. Now, as of the time of this recording, I've only written five episodes, and in two of them, I've had to dig way further into white supremacist ideology than I ever really wanted to, but here we are anyway. Yay! Yay. Uh, Christian identity is not an organized religious denomination. Thank goodness. And as such, there seems to be a lot of infighting about each group's teachings. What the Christian identity movement can agree on is that the Aryans are God's chosen race and that people of Celtic or Germanic ancestry are descendants of ancient Israelites and therefore the only true descendants of Adam and Eve. Isn't that um, very Hitler? Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. A lot of, not all, but a lot of Christian identity ideals. I'm not entirely sure which predates which uh, because I didn't look into it because I don't give a fuck. Um, but they are very, they share, they have a lot of similarities. I am like shook about the fact that it was literally started like in our backyard. Yeah. Like 30 minutes from our home. And what, when was it started? The, uh, the, the, uh, white supremacy thing? I think the sixties. I could be wrong about that. I know Richard Butler started it, but. Well, my point was, I was wondering if like my mom or Oma, cause they, we've lived here, they've lived here forever. Like, I wonder if they've ever heard of it or anything. They absolutely would have been around at the same time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, like my... Richard Butler was still operating the nations in the 90s. Whoa. Yeah. So he he yeah Richard Butler founded the Aryan Nations in the 70s. The and the Aryan Nations is like a like a worldwide organization now, right? Or uh, countrywide? I think they're mostly disbanded now. Oh. They they were raided at one point because they were stockpiling arms. Like, there are still members of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, yeah. Even though that's... Has that been disbanded? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the, the Klan hasn't really been, like, a... Oh, they, they haven't really been a group with, like, a centralized command structure, I guess mm-hmm. is the best way to put it, for a long time. Like, there's still cells of it. Because mm-hmm. there's always going to be racist, because mm-hmm. fuck those people. Right. Um, and that's they're what always going to find each other. Yeah, so... Even though it's disbanded, there's definitely, like, people walking around that are yeah. part of the Aryan Nation. Yeah, but the, the Aryan Nation compound in Hayden Lake is no longer. Right. Um, so, I will have to link that really cool channel, Soft White Underbelly, where, mm. um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he interviews... Different people. Sometimes it's like a sex worker or a pimp or a drug dealer or a drug addict or homeless people. It's like anybody that he can interview, he will. And he interviews members of the Ku Ku Klux Klan? Ku Klux Klan. I believe so. And it's fascinating to watch. It is fascinating to watch. I'm specifically picturing this one guy who literally looks like a wizard. He's dressed in full on like blue and gold with like a pointy hat, but They're it's so not fucking nerdy. Yeah, like, like they straight it's so up hard to like take if, if they channeled their energy into D and D campaigns, like gold fire. But instead, I'll have to link it. Yeah, in addition to Northern Europeans uh, being the only true descendants of Adam and Eve, white Europeans are the only race, and I use race in sarcastic quotes because it's a it's a dumb idea. Uh, they are the only race of people that contain souls, and everyone else will be enslaved by God's chosen when Armageddon comes. They cherry-pick passages from the Old Testament to support their ideas that mixed-race marriages are an aberration. 
Jews are descendants of Cain and therefore inherently evil. Homosexuality is a sin worthy of death and pretty much every other white supremacist dog whistle bullshit you can imagine is lumped in with this. Awesome. Please don't sound clip that to make it sound like I'm a racist because that's <laughs> the exact opposite of what I'm trying to say. I'll do my best to yeah. not make <laughs> that's, that's the one sound clip he put up on Instagram. Oh my God, oh boy. right? Uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to get at is don't bother looking into this unless you have a shower you can step into because it all sucks and it's all gross. <laughs> the biggest takeaway is that everybody who that isn't straight and white is bad. Yikes. Not only straight, but I guess cisgender straight white person <laughs> is bad. It's real. It's real awful. Yikes. Uh, I'm sure some of this was music to the weaver's ears. Randy at least was really racist, but they were always clear that they had no intentions of joining the Brotherhood. There were things they didn't agree with, but they saw the race as stronghold as a chance to meet people and make friends. Like, they lived on a mountaintop by their own, or by, the, by themselves. Their closest neighbor was like three miles away or some shit. In 1984, Randy was sued by his neighbor, Terry Kinnison, over a property dispute. Terry lost the case and was forced to cover Randy's court costs. I think it was, like, where a fence was put. Mm. Um, I don't know how close this Terry guy lived because, again, they're on top of a mountain. There are actually some, like, their view looks incredible because mm. their compound sits on top of a mountain. It's I bet their view was awesome. Mm-hmm. But their views were not. Yeah, correct. Well, Randy's at least. Yeah. Vicky's too. The kids were probably fine. Instead of dropping the issue like a rational person, Kennison wrote letters to the FBI, Secret Service, and the local sheriff's office. In these letters, Terry alleged that Randy had threatened to kill Pope John Paul II, President Ronald Reagan, and Idaho Governor John Evans. These claims were all probably more than likely bullshit, Mm. but death threats against the president can't be overlooked. During the subsequent investigation, the FBI and the Secret Service were told that Randy was a member of the Aryan Nations and had a large cache of weapons stored on his property. They interviewed Randy and Vicky, who denied the allegations, and no charges were filed. As already discussed, both of these allegations were lies. Sure, Randy was friends with some racists. Sure, the Weavers had hunting guns. I mean, they did live in the middle of the woods without power. Mm. Enter Frank Kumnick. Kumnick? Kumnick. Doesn't matter. Fuck him. (laughs) Kumnick was part of a group called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. No! The Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. Another far-right Christian identity militant organization. Uh, In 1986... Frank Kumnick, militant racist fuckhat, was the main target of an ATF investigation with allegations that the Aryan Nations and the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, which is really just a mouthful, but it's fun to say, uh, were stockpiling and selling illegal firearms. Kumnick invited Randy Weaver to that year's annual World Aryan Congress at the Aryan Nations compound in Hayden Lake. The Congress was mostly a recruitment tool that attracted the KKK, skinheads, and other assorted neo-Nazi groups. It must have been such a sight to see. People in, like, white sheets walking around with skinheads and bikers. The documentary I watched for this (laughs) has, like, little snippets of their... It's like people just walking around in lines chanting. This gathering of some of the most racist people in the country included an ATF informant undercover as a weapons dealer who was introduced to Randy. The informant and Weaver would meet several times over the next few years. Randy, living in a mountaintop compound in North Idaho, was having a hard time making an income to, pr- to provide for his family. The agent, being such a good friend, offered to pay Randy to saw the barrels off two shotguns, which is a federal crime. This is basically, if not technically, entrapment, and the ATF tried using these gun charges as leverage to get him to turn informant against the Aryan Nations. This is a pretty common practice, but I really think it sucks. I don't think that should be a thing that federal agents are doing. They were essentially saying, we have these charges on you, give us information on other members of the Aryan Nations, or we stick you in jail and take your property. And they literally paid him to do that, so that they could... Mm -hmm. Yikes. Yep. Ouch. Because it's not a crime until he hands it... Well, it's a crime sawing off the barrel, but until you hand it to somebody, there's no proof of it. Uh, Now, telling Randy Weaver that you're going to stick him in jail and take take his property is not the best thing to do with somebody like this. Uh, He moved to Idaho specifically to get away from what he saw as a corrupt government, and now they just tricked him into doing exactly what he was worried about. Mm -hmm. Weaver refused to turn snitch, and the gun charges were filed in 1990. 
snitches get stitches. I don't really understand why they did this, but the ATF would allege in court that Randy was a bank robber with prior criminal convictions. None of that was true. Randy Weaver, in fact, had a clean criminal record and wasn't a suspect in a single bank robbery. Uh, despite these made-up charges, the gun charges weren't entirely bogus. Randy was indicted for making and possessing illegal firearms, but not for selling them, in December of 1990 by a federal grand jury. Since grand juries don't actually convict you of a crime, Randy Weaver was not being held in custody during the grand jury's deliberation. In January of 1991, ATF agents posing as broken-down motorists stopped Randy and Vicki Weaver when they stopped to help, arresting Randy. Weaver was told of the charges against him, released on bail with their home used as bond. The realization that they could lose everything they had worked for because of the ATF's corrupting influence galvanized the Weaver's absolute distrust and hatred of the government. Vicki wrote letters to the U.S. Attorney of Idaho addressed to the servants of the Queen of Babylon, which was language straight, up, straight from the Aryan Nation's teachings. In these letters, Vicki wrote that the stink, and I quote, The stink of your lawless government has reached heaven. Whether we love or whether we die, we will not bow to your evil commandments. Everett Hoffmeister was the court-appointed attorney assigned to Randy's case on January 22nd. Randy was told to call Hoffmeister on that same day by his probation officer, but since Hoffmeister did not yet have the case file, he asked for Randy's phone number, which he doesn't have. Remember, they're living on a cabin without electricity, without a phone, without running water. Mm -hmm. So the only way that he could actually call into anywhere was by going to a neighbor's or a pay phone to contact anyone. Multiple letters from Hoffmeister were sent to the cabin in an attempt to get Randy to come in and work on his defense, but they went unanswered. Finally, on February 5th, the presiding judge, Judge Harold Ryan, moved the trial date from the 19th to the 20th due to some obscure federal holiday called President's Day. The notice for the date change was sent to the probation officer and attorney. He wanted that weekend off for sure. I mean, <laughs> it's a federal holiday. It's on every calendar ever. Yeah. I don't know how you missed that. Yeah. I... <laughs> the notice for the date change was sent to the probation officer and attorney, but never directly to Randy. Since no one was able to contact the Weavers, Randy never showed up for his court date, and a warrant for <gasps> failure to appear in court was issued. Oh my god, because they couldn't call him or anything. Right. They oh, had, yikes. Short of physically going to his cabin. To talk to him. There's really not an easy way to get in touch with him. Yeah. Could you imagine being their mail person? No. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> to drive to the top of a mountain to drop off a letter. Seriously. <laughs> Turns out the letters that were being sent to the Weaver cabin all had the incorrect date of March 20th, not February 20th. Oh, okay. Mm. Again, I don't know how you fucked that up. When a reporter with the Kootenai Valley Times informed the probation office of this mistake, the U.S. Marshals assigned to arrest Weaver decided to hold off to see if Randy would show up in court on that date. Uh, Judge Ryan refused to withdraw the arrest warrant, and on March 14th, the U.S. Attorney's Office called another grand jury and Weaver was indicted for failure to appear in court. When the marshals ar arrived to arrest Randy, he remained in his cabin and told them he would resist any attempt to take him. There were multiple attempts by the U.S. marshals to get Randy to leave peacefully, with negotiations lasting from March to October 1991. Wow, that's a long time. That's a long time. After seven months, the U.S. Uh, the assistant U.S. attorney Ron Howen, Howen, Howen. Said all negotiations must go through Everett Hoffmeister, who must just be fucking hating his job at this point. He's a court-appointed attorney, and now he's a not not a hostage negotiator, but yeah, yeah, his job his job has to suck. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Randy doesn't trust this guy and refuses to have any dealings with him. With negotiations broken down, the marshals began devising a strategy to get Randy out by force if needed. Ooh. Surveillance cameras were installed on the property to keep tabs on people coming and going from the cabin, and agents noted that the Weavers would post up with weapons every time a vehicle would approach. So these people ran to the top of a mountain to get away from a government that they saw, a government and a world for that matter, that they saw as corrupt and soon to burn an apocalyptic hellfire. Mm. And now they've got government like doing their damnness to not only break up their family, but also take everything they owned mm -hmm. so the yeah the weavers are the weavers are having none of this which is part of the reason he decided not to show up to court he's like no fuck the government i don't, I don't want anything to do with them and they keep they're trying to screw me over at every turn so i'm not going to go there i mean i wouldn't trust him either at this point yeah yeah i mean he's 
I see where he's coming from at I'd this be like, point. Fuck you guys. Yeah, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with everything he does, but at this point, it's you see why he's a little yeah. cautious. Yeah, with I wanting I, to participate. I don't know, blame the guy. Yeah, he's not very cooperative, and I don't blame him. Part of the plan to arrest Weaver involved a threat assessment done by the marshals. In this, they concluded that Randy was ex special forces and had likely booby trapped the property, and Vicky would sooner kill herself and her own children than be taken alive. Ooh, yikes! That's entirely speculation on the marshals' part, right? Uh, They're just assuming it's booby trapped and that she's going to kill herself and her kids. Yeah. He's, oh, he was a Green Beret. We saw Rambo. <laughs> Once the media got wind of this, they had a field day with it. Stories of the white separatists that would sooner die than be taken were printed in every newspaper in the area. One such story in the Spokesman Review by Bill Moreland, titled Feds Have Fugitive Under Our Nose, he quoted government officials saying that they didn't want to go up to the mountain and get into a gun battle with kids. But they had a federal judge demanding they go and arrest Randy anyway. The U.S. Marshals were starting to feel like the Weavers were just flipping them the bird and they had to deal with it. It was around this time that they installed motion-activated cameras around the property. They wanted to know who was up there, who was carrying guns, and how many dogs were out there. <sighs> They're going to kill the dogs. Really got really to start putting trigger warnings in these. More importantly, how could they get in to arrest Randy without starting a fight? They discovered that not only was everyone frequently armed, but that another man named Kevin Harris had been staying with them. In May of 1992, Randy did an interview in which he basically said that there was no way he was coming down from his mountain. On August 21st, 1992, two teams of U.S. Marshals were scouting the area around the cabin looking for a suitable place to finally arrest Weaver. But they came to a Y on the old road they were on when the team split. One team went further up the mountain to gain a vantage point above the cabin. They were there to gather intel the cameras couldn't provide and set up a surveillance outpost. The other team took the path that led them closer to the cabin. One of the marshals, Art Roderick, threw two rocks towards the cabin to test the dog's reaction. The dogs, being dogs, started barking, at which point the already very on-edge Randy, his friend Kevin Harris, and the now 14-year-old Samuel Weaver came out of the cabin with guns and their dog Striker while the recon team retreated. I remember reading, but I didn't write it down for sure, that they came out of the cabin hoping that it was like a game animal that they could hunt because they had been locked in their cabin for mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. over a year at this point. Mm -hmm. So they kind of wanted some fresh meat. While the cabin inhabitants were searching for the animal they hoped to find, they came across the recon team down the road leading to the cabin. It's unclear ex uh, exactly what happened next since Randy and Kevin would tell a very different story than the Marshall team. One side says the Marshalls silenced the dog striker. I say silence, they killed the dog. Yeah, they shot the dog, Striker. Killed him. Uh, and Samuel exploded, shouting, You killed my dog, you son of a bitch, and returned fire. Literally what I would do if someone shot my dog, so. Yeah, me too. They've been holed up in their cabin for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. They're going down a logging road, ostensibly, to look for an animal mm -hmm. to eat. Mm -hmm. And now they come across some guys in tactical camo that just shot their dog. Like, on a logging road. Uh, the other side of the story from the marshals uh, is that the agents clearly identified themselves and gave peaceful surrender orders. Regardless of what actually happened, uh, Stryker and Samuel were killed by marshals and Kevin Harris killed uh, Deputy United States Marshal Bill Deegan. Samuel was shot in the back, likely while, trying, uh, while retreating to cover behind a tree. The FBI was called in with additional assistance requested from Idaho law enforcement. Uh, this is pretty standard protocol when a federal officer is killed. What isn't standard protocol is, is the decision to not fill in the FBI agents on the whole situation. Mm -hmm. The agents that arrived on the scene were under the assumption that Randy, Sammy, and Kevin had opened fire on the marshals unprovoked, and they were entering an ongoing firefight. <gasps> okay. As such, surrender warnings are unnecessary. The next day, a 10-man sniper team was approved and rules of engagement were drafted. Quoting a 1996 Senate report on the incident, uh, the ROE gave law enforcement agents virtual shoot-on-site orders, and the rules read as follows. And I'm quoting from the actual rules of, uh, rules of engagement that were drafted. Number one, if any adult in the area around the cabin is observed with a weapon after, after the surrender announcement has been made, deadly force could and should be used to neutralize the individual. Number two, if any adult male is observed with a weapon prior to the announcement, deadly force can and should be employed if the shot could be taken without endangering any children. 
Why Keep that they, in mind. Why do they even say can and should? They might as well just say should. They're literally just saying shoot anyone. We'll talk about that here in awesome. a couple minutes too. I love this story. Mm. Number three, if compromised, any dog uh, can be taken out. Number four, any subjects other than Randy Weaver, Vicki Weaver, or Kevin Harris presenting threat of death or grievous bodily harm, FBI rules of deadly force apply. Deadly force can be utilized to prevent the death or grievous bodily injury to oneself or that of another. I found it interesting that the second rule specified adult male. Uh, it turns out they did that on purpose. Uh, they changed that from just adults because Vicky wasn't recorded as present on the logging road where the shootout occurred. She was also not seen with guns often. Like she obviously knew how to use them and she carried them, but she wasn't always armed. It should also be noted that some of the SWAT team members were taken aback by the list of rules with Denver SWAT team leaders saying they were severe and inappropriate. Others would mention that the ROE, which rules of engagement, were a departure from the standard deadly force policy. So after the shootout with the, the marshals in the woods, Weaver and Harris were able to get Samuel's body back to the cabin. They just kind of stuck him in the woodshed out back because what else do you do with him? While visiting the body of his son, Randy Weaver was shot in the back by FBI sniper named Lon Horiuchi. Lon Hor? Lon Horiuchi. Is that the first name? Lon is his first name. Hori Uchi is the last name. I thought his name was Lon Hor Uchi. And I'm like, that's <laughs> so fucking cool. No, Lon Hori Uchi. When Randy turned to flee back to the cabin, Hori Uchi took another shot at Kevin Harris, wounding him as well. This shot would hit Vicki Weaver, who was standing behind the cabin door, killing her. She was holding the Weaver's youngest child, Elishba. Randy picks up his infant daughter, handing her to Rachel, and drags his wife cor- wife's corpse inside the cabin to shut the door. The 11-day siege of Ruby Ridge had now begun in earnest. Horiuchi would later justify his shot, saying that he thought they were going to open fire on a helicopter while retreating into the house after being shot at. Okay. It's interesting to note how the press coverage changed after Bill Deegan was killed. Before the firefight in the woods, most of the coverage talked about these people, uh, talked about these people in the woods who just wanted to be left alone, standing up to the man and refusing to be taken into custody. Mm. After, though, the coverage was more... Five other U.S. Marshals are trapped near white supremacist Randy Weaver's home. During the siege, the press only had access to the official record from federal law enforcement until the FBI discovered Sammy's body in the shed. At this point, journalists started reaching out to Randy and Vicky's families back in Iowa who helped paint a picture of a close-knit religious family rather than just a bunch of white supremacists out in the woods. The narrative started changing, and people began demonstrating at the FBI roadblock. Of course, racists gonna racist, and the Aryan nations use this as an opportunity to push their anti-government, pro-white people agenda. A group of skinheads was arrested trying to smuggle guns up to the cabin. I don't really know what their end game was. There's one way in and out of the property. And they're like, yeah, we're just gonna drive this jeep full of weapons past the FBI. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I don't really know how they thought that was gonna go, but they were, they were stopped. After all of this, the FBI decided to try negotiations again. Randy, understandably, did not want to respond to them. Mm -hmm. In three days, his wife, son, and dog were killed, and he and his friend were seriously wounded. Like, at this point, Kevin, the wound that Kevin had was slowly killing him. Um, Where was he shot? I, fuck. It was in the side, I think. He wasn't wounded so grievously that it stopped the bullet, obviously, but he was still wounded pretty badly. Mm. Not to mention his distrust of the government was becoming more and more justified as the siege drew on. No kidding. Like, what, you're sure expecting a lot from someone that you're really backing into a corner here. Yeah. Since there wasn't a phone in the cabin, the negotiations team, uh, their only option was to just shout things towards the cabin on a megaphone. Want to guess what those things were? Uh, how about, Vicky, why don't you come out and talk to us? And we're having pancakes. Do you and the kids want to come out and have some? Oh, ew. They didn't know they killed Vicky. Oh. Because they didn't know she was standing behind the door when because the sniper took a Because you're not supposed to shoot where you don't know. You're not supposed yeah. to, like, blindly shoot into a building. Mm-hmm. Amazing. They weren't supposed to endanger kids, so he shot towards a building. And she was holding I, a baby when she was shot, right? Yeah. Was the yeah, baby Yeah, was like 10. No. No. That's I, amazing. I think Elisheva was... Not quite a year at this point. Wow. They eventually managed to get like a radio onto the the cabin's deck so they could speak to the people inside the house where Randy was finally like, hey, you guys killed my wife and my son's dad. You know what's probably really hard to do? 
To get someone to convince him to stop a standoff after you killed them. Okay. 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 Cool. 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 <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Vicky was the religious leader of the house and a big personality. And they thought that they could appeal to her to get Randy to end the standoff. So when, uh, when Randy informed the FBI that they had killed his wife, they, they changed tactics a little bit. Um, and they decided they got in contact with somebody with another ex-Green Beret, uh, James Bo Gritz. Bo was his nickname. Randy finally agreed to speak to him. And Bo was confident that he could end the, peace, uh, end the standoff peacefully. Bo was able to get Kevin Harris out of the cabin and Vicky's body removed. Harris was airlifted to Sacred Heart in Spokane, where he was treated for his gunshot. Uh, oh, it was through his arm and his chest. So that's what it was. And survived. Randy and his daughters surrendered the following day on August 31st, where he was flown to Boise to await trial. Both Weaver and Harris were charged with a variety of, of offenses, including murdering a federal agent, a conspiracy to commit murder, and the original gun charges. Weaver's defense attorney, Jerry Spence, rested his case without calling a single witness to the stand. He instead swayed the jury with cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses and discrediting the government's actions. After the longest jury deliberation in Idaho state history, Weaver and Harris were clear of all charges except the initial failure to appear in court. He wow. was sentenced to 18 months in jail and fined $10,000. All, all of this, all of this happened. Because he, well, it all started because he had a picnic one time with the Aryan nations, which is gross. But maybe not murder half of your family grows. I just think it's funny that the court was like, I just, I'm amazed that something so small just turned into something so chaotic. Yeah. I mean, so quickly. Illegally modifying guns isn't, I mean, it's a federal, it's a federal offense. Right. So I, I, I understand why they were like, hey, you know, we can't have that. Okay, right. Let's but the, get the fact that it. they kind of. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's... Like, a, it's it could have happened the way the law was supposed to happen. Like, right. he was doing something wrong, but, like, now it turned into this whole thing where he didn't show up in court, and so it literally caused him to lose a dog, a kid, and a wife. Mm -hmm. I like how you put the dog first. <laughs> I don't know who you think I am. It was in that order. But, I mean, you understand why this is this is mut a lot like Waco. Mm. It, it's a case where people look at it, and they're like, oh, yeah, the government, this is nothing but government malfeasance. Because they didn't handle it great. No. I mean, the, no. It, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty vehemently anti-Aryan nations, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, the guy lost his kid and his wife. Lon Horiuchi was indicted with manslaughter for the death of Vicky Weaver in a Boundary County court. He was heavily criticized for shooting towards the cabin door while aiming for Harris without knowing if someone was on the other side. Like, rule 101 of shooting. Well, always assume the gun is loaded. But rule 2 of shooting. You don't just shoot when you don't know what's behind it. And that's that's part of the reason that the rules of engagement were so heavily criticized later mm. is Harris was fleeing back inside the building, mm -hmm. but he was holding a gun. Mm -hmm. And per the rules of engagement, he should have been he should have been eliminated. Mm -hmm. Neutralized. Neutralized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't know if anyone was on the other side of the door and he's firing a high caliber sniper rifle like that's crazy. What are you doing, man? The case was moved to a federal court since Lon had been acting in the line of duty as a federal agent, and the federal judge dismissed the case. Lon would later be present at the Siege of Waco as well, and some with some reports stating that he was the one who called out hearing shots fired inside the compound. Oh, yikes. He yeah. was, oh, yikes on both of those. Mm -hmm. Ooh, common denominator. Ugh. It was also found during an internal investigation that at least one FBI agent had tried to cover up the agency's wrongdoings. <laughs> Shocking. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison and a $4,000 fine after admitting to destroying a report on the matter. IA is such a fucking joke. Randy and his daughters filed a $200 million wrongful death suit against the federal government. This was settled out of court for $3.1 million, but the government admitted to no wrongdoing. I don't think the government has ever admitted to wrongdoing. Well, it looks bad. <laughs> Does it look bad to take responsibility? I beg to differ. As that depends on what side of the federal government you're on. Harris also sued the government for damages uh, to the tune of $10 million and settled out of court for $380,000. The events at Ruby Ridge and later Waco, Texas, are partially credited with inspiring Timothy McVeigh to bomb the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. Ooh. 
The rules of engagement used by officers were later deemed unconstitutional, and deadly force policies were standardized to fix this oversight. And that is the end of our story today. Uh, Randy Weaver is still, he remarried at some point. Like I said, he would later go on record saying that he was an atheist. Sarah Weaver was interviewed for a PBS documentary that I used as, uh, for a lot of the information that I pulled out for this story. Samuel obviously perished during the siege. And Elishba and Rachel, I don't have anything from them. I don't know that they've ever been interviewed. They were both Probably very don't young. Probably want to be. <laughs> Well, they were also both very young. Right. Like, Elishabeau was born in a shed out behind the cabin. What a way to be brought into the world. They were... They, <laughs> that's that's something that I decided not to include, but here I am including it anyway, is that they were such religious fundamentalists that the very act of child labor was considered dirty. Oh, wow. So, yeah, her, her fourth child was born in a shed outside. How sad for you that it makes it so dirty bringing a life into the world. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. I mean, she was probably the one that made that determination, but, man, that's our, that's our story for today. How you feeling? I promise they won't all be bad. Do you? Yeah. Is that what you promise? Yeah, I promise they won't all be bad. This is your second episode that you've released on our channel as a bonus. So, You're welcome. So I want to know what listeners think. So you should email us. That was terrible. What are you going to tell us next time? Uh, next time we're actually going to dig into Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. So I hope you're not feeling too high because I'm going to bring you right back down. Awesome. I'll put all the links and pictures and everything on our Instagram. Um, but you'll have your own photos and everything. So it'll still be easy to like pinpoint and you'll be able to see it. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye!